drew the short straw this morning. I wasn't prepared. Had no idea. No, I'm kidding. I knew well in advance, and I always counted an honor and a privilege to be able to come to the pulpit. I have to tell you, I'm terrified every time I get up here. I'm not afraid of you guys. I have no problem speaking publicly. I am terrified about ever stepping in the pulpit and not having the anointing of the Holy Ghost when I'm ministering. Because uh, I don't want it to be me that's doing the ministering. I want it to be the Holy Ghost that is doing the ministering. Because the word is good, but the word by itself killeth, right? But it's the spirit that gives the word life. And I want that spirit to go ahead and minister through me this morning. I want to be able to tap in, and I, I want you guys to be able to tap in as well, because I want God to speak through this vessel into your hearts, into your minds. And I want us all to leave here differently. God has been dealing with me for at least a week on this topic, and so I believe that God is going to minister to somebody today. And if nobody else right here, he's going to speak to me. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to go ahead and let's uh, turn to Mark chapter 12, verse 30, and then I'll allow you to be seated. The title of this sermon, if I have to give it a title, is In It to Win It. Hallelujah. If we're going to do this, then we better do it with everything we've got. Because we've got to hit the mark. I am in it to win it. I'm not going halfway. I'm not hitting the ball just to go to first base. I'm hitting that ball because I want to hit a home run. I want the bases to be loaded. I want to hit a grand slam. I am in it to win it. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 reads, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Jesus, we worship you. We praise you, God. We thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your blessing and your kindness. God, we thank you that you have allowed us to be here, that you have brought us here safely. God, we ask and pray that you would move and that you would minister. God, that you would speak to our hearts this morning. God, I pray that you would anoint these lips of clay. Lord, that your word would go forth with your anointing. Hallelujah. Open our hearts and our minds. Open our ears in the name of Jesus. God, we invite you in today. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said amen. Praise God. You may be seated. The part you've all been waiting for. The scripture that we just read speaks of commitment, and not just any commitment, but it speaks of a very deep commitment. We'll come back to that in a little bit. First, we're going to take a little stroll down history lane. If any of you re remember your World War II history, there is a battle that took extreme commitment. The United States was not in this particular battle in World War II but it was the siege of Stalingrad. One of the bloodiest battles during that period. An incredible fight that took place between the German army and the Russians. The Russians consider this the greatest battle of their great patriotic war, and most historians consider it to be the greatest battle of the entire war. There were roughly two million casualties alone in this battle which combined both military personnel and civilians. Many bombs, not just troops from Germany, were sent to barrage the Russians, but many bombs were lobbed into Stalingrad. And Stalingrad had a great number of civilians in it, and the city was reduced to rubble. I don't know that I would necessarily stay and fight for San Jose personally if people were lobbing bombs this direction. I would be more inclined to take my family and find a, a place of shelter, a place of safety. But the people in Stalingrad, they were determined that they were not giving up this ground. 
Stalin himself was determined that Stalingrad would not fall because it was the city that bared his own name. He's not going to give up Stalingrad. It's not going to happen. The people, as the city was reduced to rubble, they began to fight. They began to just go down into the into holes that were within the rubble. And they used to dig it out, and they would um, bury themselves in there. The Russians would, and as the Germans would advance, they would just begin to fight like rats. And actually, that's what uh, Hitler gave that particular battle. I think he called it Ratkrieg or something like that. Battle of the Rats, basically, in, in English. I don't know the name in German. But Battle of the Rats. Because they could not get in there. It was like fighting rats. Every time they, they would come in, the Russians would fight with everything that they had. They would come out of holes. They would come out of rubble. And they would begin picking off the German officers and trying to kill the, the snake by taking off its head so that the Russians, or I'm sorry, the Germans would have to retreat. They'd have to step back. It was a great cost of lives. There were only about 150,000 Germans that were killed. That means almost 2 million Russians were killed in trying to save this one city. But what they knew, they knew that they were fighting for a city. They were fighting not to give up ground. But what they really knew is if they surrendered to the Germans, that it meant death anyway. So there was absolutely no way that they could surrender and live. It was fight and potentially die or surrender and know you're going to die for sure. It took a tremendous amount of commitment for them in that battle. No matter how much was thrown their way, no matter how dire the situation or the consequences, they were determined to fight to the very end. They may have even been wounded, but they were not going to give up without a fight. In the end, they were able to save Stalingrad because of the level of commitment that they had made. As Christians, we have a battle that we are in on a daily basis. We've got so much going on. It's, we, we've really got to make sure that we don't lose sight of what the battle is really is or what's really happening around us. We can, lose, we can become distracted by all of the things that are around us. So we have to remember that we are in a battle and we can't become so focused on everything around us that we lose sight of the battle that we're in. Let's take this from the perspective of what's our goal first. We'll talk about the battle in a little bit, but what are we actually fighting for? There's no sense in fighting if we don't know what we're fighting for. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 18 reads, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We all love that let's be glorified together part. The suffering with them isn't so much fun. But when we're in a battle, there's going to come times where there's a little bit of suffering that's going to take place. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, he goes on, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Regardless of what we face, regardless of how intense the battle, regardless of if we become wounded, regardless of how much struggle we may face or how much suffering we may have to endure in this flesh, it does not compare to what is ahead of us. It does not compare to the home that God has prepared for us. That's what we're fighting for. We're fighting to get through the flesh in order to get to our heavenly home that God has prepared. I am an heir of God. I am a child of God. And I look forward to the day that I am able to step through those pearly gates and I want to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But it's not going to come without a fight. And it's not going to come without commitment. Hallelujah. Praise God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. This is where Paul writes his letter to Timothy. He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Hallelujah. 
We are soldiers. We are in a battle. To think otherwise is silly. To think otherwise is foolishness because the enemy is suited up for war. And if we think we can walk around waving the peace flag, we're sorely mistaken. We will lose the battle. So what is this battle that we're in? We know what we really want, but what's the battle that we're in? Romans chapter 8. And I love the Bible, guys. Sorry, I, I really love reading the Word. I love teaching the Word and, and bringing out scriptures because I think God can speak a whole lot better than what I can. So when I get up here, I'm going to just bring out the Word. Romans chapter 8, verses 4 through 11. This is the battle that we're in that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is now subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If we're following after our flesh, we cannot please him. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If we consider ourselves Christ, then we've got to have the spirit of God within us. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What's the battle? The battle is the spirit against the flesh. That's the battle. Every day when we wake up and we take a breath, we are in that battle simply by the virtue of breathing. I'm sorry. I don't think there's anybody perfect in here. I know that I would like to think that I'm close, and I like to convince my wife and my children I'm pretty close, but I know it's not true. I am not perfect. You're not perfect. The only perfect one that was, he still is. But he came and he went, and he's the one that's preparing a home for us. He's the only perfect one. Hallelujah. So that as long as we're breathing, we are going to fight and we are going to struggle, and each of us are going to have our own individual battles that we are going to have to face. There's a whole list of them in the Bible. I'm not going to break out a list of things that we can struggle with, but for each and every individual, it can be different. Hallelujah. What are we fighting against? We know that we're warring, or we're, the battle is the flesh and the spirit, okay? But what are we fighting against? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we're not just battling against our flesh, but there are spirits and there are things that are intent on derailing us in our walk with Christ. There are things that are going to come at us trying to distract us and trying to throw out shiny promises to allure you and to distract you and pull you away from God to try to snare you into doing things that are not right, that are not godly. What are we warring with? We know, it's, we know what we're fighting. What are we warring with? Romans chapter 7, verses 19 through 25 says, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. So the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, so the things, the sinful things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing those things. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. In other words, I'm given over to my sinful nature. Those things that I don't want to do when I do those things, it's because I'm giving myself over to my sinful nature. I've made a decision. 
Because each of us have a decision to make when we come to that crossroad. Am I or am I not going to participate in this behavior? It's not like you haven't got the choice. We've got the choice. And we make that choice. I find that a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Yeah, that's right. We're in the flesh, right? That's what we're fighting against. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Christ Jesus, or through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We are fighting. Every day we are fighting a battle between the spirit and the flesh. There are principalities, and we are dealing with the sinful nature, the law of sin. We are dealing with our flesh. And the reality is if we're not fighting, then we're not winning. It's a daily battle. We're going to struggle with thoughts, ideas, emotions, desires, spirits, feelings. Every single one of us are subject to these things. If I'm so focused on the temporal, then I'm going to lose sight of the eternal. The battle we're facing is going to take a very serious commitment. If we're going to win, if we're going to overcome, if we're going to make it, then we've got to be committed to the cause. Let's go back to our original text because I believe the answer to our ability to be successful in our battle is in that one verse. This is why it's the first commandment. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. I'm going to read it again. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So I used a commentary Uh, or I use the commentary critical and explanatory on the whole Bible to dissect this particular verse. We're going to go through this. And thou shalt. We have here the language of law, right? Thou shalt. It's not a, hey, you might want to do this. You may want to consider this. Thou shalt means do this. There is no ands, ifs, or buts about it. Right? If I tell my kids, thou shalt take out the trash, they're going to take out the trash. Thou shalt go and take care of the dog droppings in the backyard. They shall go do it. Okay, It's not a, hey, get to it when you can or want to because I know it will never get done. We'll have trash overflowing in the kitchen. The backyard will look like a dung heap. Okay, So we got to get the job done. Thou shalt. So ex- this is... Uh, The language of law, expressive of God's claims. What then are we bound down to do? One word is made to express it. And what a word, love, right? Had the essence of the divine law consisted in deeds, it could not possibly have been expressed in a single word. For no one deed is comprehensive of all others embraced in the law. But as it consists in one affection of the soul, One word suffices to express it, but only one. Fear, though due to God and enjoined by him, is limited in its severe and distant in character. Trust, hope, and the like, though essential features of a right state of heart towards God are called into action only by personal necessity, and so are, in a good sense, it is true, but still are properly selfish affections. These are selfish affections. That is to say, they have respect to our own well-being. But love is an all-inclusive affection, embracing not only every other affection proper to its object, but all that is proper to be done to its object. For as love spontaneously seeks to please its object, so in the case of men to God, It is the native wellspring of a voluntary obedience. It is besides the most personal of all affections. 
One may fear an event. One may hope for an event. One may rejoice in an event. But one can love only a person. It is the most tender, the most unselfish, the most divine of all affections. Such then is the affection in which the essence of the divine law is declared to consist. Thou shalt love. Thou shalt love. We now come to the glorious object of that demanded affection. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. But with what are we to love him? Four things are specified in this verse that we're taking today. First, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy heart. This sometimes means the whole inner man, as in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. But that cannot be meant here in this particular verse, for then the other three things specified would be redundant. Very often it means our emotional nature, the seat of feeling as distinguished from our intellectual nature or the seat of thought commonly called the mind, as in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. But neither can this be the sense of it here. For here the heart is distinguished both from the mind and the soul. The heart, then, must here mean the sincerity of both the thoughts and the feelings. In other words, uprightness or true-heartedness as opposed to a hypocritical or divided affection. All that to say, we cannot have an undivided affection. Luke chapter 16, verse 13 reads, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. He was talking about money in this particular setting, but you can take mammon out and you could put anything else in there. You cannot serve God and your love for cars. You cannot serve God and your love for material possessions. You cannot serve God and whatever it may be that you want to put in there. Put it in there. We cannot have a divided heart. We cannot serve two masters. It's one of the biggest problems that we have in our world today. We want to say that we live for God, but then we want to follow our flesh the rest of the week. We want to show up on Sunday, and we want to live for God on Sunday. But we want to give ourselves over to whatever else we have affections for throughout the rest of the week. Hallelujah. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23 reads, And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath. Who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. I want God to keep covenant with me. I want to have covenant with God. Hallelujah. And if that be the case, then I know that I cannot walk with God with a divided heart. My affection cannot be divided and split up. It has to be on God. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. Second, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy soul. This is designed to command our emotional nature. Thou shalt put feeling or warmth into your affection. The soul is the seat of the feelings, desires, aversions, and affections we have and experience. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 reads, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Love the Lord thy God with thy soul. Third, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy mind. This commands our intellectual nature. Thou shalt put intelligence into your affection in opposition to a blind devotion. I remember growing up in church. The bulk of my Christianity, sadly, was based on what I heard across the pulpit. And I thank God I had a good pastor. He was a great teacher. He was a really good preacher. So I had some really good word of God. But as a young man, I wasn't spending enough time in prayer 
and putting the word of God in my own heart. It's something that I had to learn the hard way. It's something that I had to fall in love with. When I started having trials and temptations and struggles, I then had to turn to the word of God. I started having doubts. I started having questions. It wasn't going to work living off of mom and dad's experience. It wasn't going to work just living off of something that came across the platform. But I then had to start digging into the word of God, and I had to find out, okay, why on earth am I acting the way that I'm acting? People are asking me questions. I don't know. Because they told us to at church. Okay, so you're doing that, and you have no idea why. Yeah. You're an idiot. (laughs) No, I'm not. I love God. So my intentions may have been pure, but I had absolutely no intellect about what it was or why it was I was doing what I was doing. I had to dig in. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 puts it this way. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. Wow. No knowledge. Didn't put the law of God in their mind. I will also forget thy children. Ignorance. As judges like to say, it's not a good defense. Well, Your Honor, I didn't know that drinking and driving was against the law. So I went ahead and did it. It felt good. Your Honor, I had no idea that beating my children to a bloody pulp was a bad thing. It seemed good at the time. Ignorance is not a proper defense. We have to know the law. And in this case, If we want to make it to heaven, we've got to know the laws of God. We've got to put them in our heart. And the only way to get them written in our heart is to put them in our mind. And we have to know it. And we have to believe it. And we have to chew on it. We have to think about it. And we have to pray on it. And the word of God will come to life. It will begin to shape us and mold us. It will change us from the inside out. The more we begin to connect with him, the more we want to look and act like him. I'm not saying the battle is ever going to be easy, but it will be easier when we commit ourselves and we love God with our heart, soul, and mind. The fourth one, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy strength. This commands our energies. Thou shalt put intensity into thine affection. Do it with your might. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. What? What he's saying, this is Solomon, and what he's saying When you find something you like to do, you've got work to do, do it with everything you've got because this is your first and only chance. You're born once and you die once. So between here and the grave, give it everything you've got. Do it with everything you've got because when we get old and we pass on, we don't get another opportunity. So give it everything we've got. While we can. So now let's look at exercising this scripture because, again, we are in a battle. And I believe that this is the key in winning the battle that we're in. In exercising this scripture in its most perfect form, it would read as follows Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, says the law. Right? Thou shalt. That's the law. With all thy heart or with perfect sincerity, an undivided heart. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, or with the utmost fervor. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind, or in the fullest exercise of an enlightened reason. The only way we're going to get enlightened is by picking up the book and reading it. 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy strength or with the whole energy of our being. It's going to be a battle. But if we're going to win the battle, then we've got to follow the Scripture. Commitment means that regardless of what may come our way, that we're going to stay the course. That we're going to put one foot in front of the other. And while sometimes we may want to shift to the left, or we want to shift to the right, or we may want to turn all together and run the other direction because something has us petrified, but you simply put your nose to the grindstone and you keep pushing forward. Why? Because we've made a commitment. It's like marriage. Marriage is an earthly example of our walk with God. We make marriage vows. We commit in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse. In other words, whatever happens, I'm going to stay the course. I made a commitment to my wife, and I'm going to stay the course with my wife. And then I hope and pray that the commitment that my wife has made is exactly the same. And that whatever comes our way, we are going to stay the course. Our relationship with God is exactly the same. I've committed myself to God, and he committed himself to me back at Calvary. I am committed to staying the course. Because his home is where I want my home to be when I lay my head down to rest that final time. And I blow out my final breath. The next time I open my eyes, I want to see my loving Savior. Hallelujah. That is my goal. That is my desire. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 reads, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. We are soldiers. We are soldiers. We are fighting for something that is dear and precious, and we are going to have to potentially endure hardness as a good soldier. And we cannot entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life because of the fact that we can't have divided affections. The divided affection is what will cause us to stumble and fall. We lose sight of the goal when our affections become divided. If even only momentary, it can be fatal. I think of Lot's wife. She and her family were being spared. But her affection wasn't on her salvation. It was on what she was being saved from. And in that very moment when she had salvation in her grasp, that simple motion cost her everything. Not only is it problematic to look back on what we have been saved from, but also allowing self-condemnation to settle over us for the mistakes that we've made. We feel less than who and what we are. That's a trick of the enemy. Because the enemy doesn't want you to understand the power in which you now live and operate. We can be so focused on our past and the mistakes that we've made that we lose sight of what's most important. That is what's in front of us, what's ahead of us, where we are going. When our focus is on what's behind us, we run the risk of creating much bigger problems for ourselves. Let me give you a couple of examples. Anybody in here know what a kick and go is? There's got to be some people in here that had those when they were a kid. I don't see anybody. Wow. Okay. I had a kick and go. I loved my kick and go. And it's a scooter 
with a little lever on the back, and you wouldn't have to put your foot to the side. You just push this lever, and it's connected to a chain, connected to the back tire, and you can make that thing go really fast. I loved my kick and go. I was at a neighbor's house, and there was a crowd in the driveway, and everybody was doing different things with their bicycles and skateboards and whatever we had going on out there, and it was my turn, and I had my kick and go. And everybody's like, go, Phil. I remember seven years old, okay? This, this memory is not a good memory. <laughs> I got on that kick and go, and I went from the top of that driveway, and I went right out into the street as fast as I can go, and I had my head down because I was pumping that thing as fast as I could, and I'm paying attention to what's behind me because everybody's cheering me on. So behind me and back down, heads down, and I'm cranking this little lever, pushing this thing, and all of a sudden, bam, I came to a sudden stop. I ran into a neighbor's car, <laughs> okay, because I wasn't paying attention to what was in front of me. I was too focused on what was behind me. And I cranked into this thing. I put a dent in that car. I didn't hurt myself, fortunately. I hurt my pride because everybody now, they were on the ground rolling and laughing because they, they all saw exactly what happened. I was just so intent on what I was doing. I just went straight out, just wham, right into the side of this car. It's like the car came out of nowhere. Who, where'd this materialize from? This wasn't here a moment ago. All of a sudden, it's right there. My dad was not happy. I don't know what he had to pay. I don't know how he had to fix it. I just remember him letting me know that he had to pay for the damages to the car. And back in the day, I, I don't know what it was, but nonetheless, you would think I ha would have learned my lesson, right? I didn't learn my lesson. Fast forward seven years. I'm now 14, and I'm on a bicycle. I really liked my bicycle. Enjoyed riding my bicycle. Rode that thing everywhere. Well, I was with some friends in the neighborhood, same neighborhood. We hadn't moved, same house, same neighborhood. And we had split up. So I was going off my own separate way, and a buddy of mine was going off his own separate way, and I started cranking it really hard. I knew exactly where I was going, and I was pushing really hard, trying to build up some speed, and I turn, and I'm waving goodbye to him. And he had turned, and he was facing the other direction like a smart guy. And I was busy waving. And all of a sudden, bam! And this time, it was not pretty. My bike crumpled into the back of that same neighbor's car. Oh, my Lord have mercy. The same car, the same neighbor's car. Like, what does he park there for? You don't park on the side of the street. That's what your driveway's for. This guy needs a ticket. I hit that thing so hard. I cranked my face into the back of this stupid pickup. My face hurt so bad. My nose felt like it was broken. My face was numb. I ripped a gash in my lip to where my lip was kind of hanging. It, it split so bad, it wasn't even bleeding. It just dug straight in and put, peeled it back. I got up off the street, like, dear God, <laughs> what just happened? My head hurt. I picked up my bike, and all I can think is, I hit the neighbor's car. <laughs> I hopped on that bicycle, and I rode as fast as I could. <laughs> it was the worst thing ever. But I learned my lesson. I never went forward while looking backwards again. That was the worst thing ever. When I drive, I never look backwards. <laughs> I always look forwards. Okay. <laughs> I have learned my lesson that looking backwards is the worst possible thing when we're trying to move forwards. I can't do anything about the past. I can't worry about that. Right? We're going to have regrets. We're going to do things that we're going to regret. Why? Why do we end up in this situation? Well, I look at it this way. Our metal and our resolve is going to be tested. Our metal. What's the quality of our faith? 
Because if it's not good, it's not getting in. And God has to work all those impurities out of us. Our resolve, the mental determination to make it. Are we really determined to get there? We're going to put ourselves through things. Others are going to put us through things. And then there's just life. Life is just going to happen. World events, evil, disease, etc. Things that we like. Well, if God were real, he wouldn't allow. Well, why? If God's loved so much, why then? It's life. Our metal and our resolve is going to be tested. And we're going to mess up because of all of our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, and all these tests that come our way, we are going to mess up. We're going to say things that we're going to regret. We're going to do things that we're going to regret. Unfortunately, that's just part of life. We're going to make those mistakes. But the reality of it is how we recover from those mistakes. Because you got to remember, we are in it to win it. And when you fall down, you get up and you dust yourself off and you keep going. Our pride is irrelevant. The, the mistakes that we make are irrelevant in comparison to where we're trying to go. I am in it to win it. We dust ourselves off. We keep moving. As long as there's breath in our lungs and blood flowing through our veins, the fight is not over. We have to learn to focus on what's ahead and not be distracted by what's behind us. We can't change the past, but we can prevent the same mistakes from occurring in the future. It took me twice, but that same mistake is not going to happen again. It took me ringing my bell and almost breaking my nose and really splitting my lip really good, but I learned. Keep my eyes ahead and don't focus on the past. I got to do my repentance for those things. I got to ask God to forgive me. I got to put those under the blood, but I'm going to face forward while I'm doing that. I'm going to keep moving forward and looking forward because I don't want to run into something else while I'm asking God, forgive me. God, forgive me. And looking back over here and run into something else and then have to add that to my list of God, forgive me. Let's just face on forward. And let's keep moving ahead. Praise team, if you come, I'm getting ready to bring this to a close pretty rapidly. Second Timothy chapter four, verse seven. I read that a few moments ago. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept my faith. The other part of that is verse eight. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Hallelujah. We're in a battle. And we are in it to win it. And if you want to win this battle, that one verse can help set us in the right frame of mind to get us from here to there. Love the Lord thy God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Don't allow yourself to have divided affections. We can't afford to be one way at church and allow things into our home. One of the things as a youth pastor that, that I think about when I was a youth pastor, that we as parents, we make decisions every day what we're going to allow into our house, what we're going to allow in, into our lives. Do we consider the impact? If we're living halfway for God, do we consider the impact on our kids? Do we really understand that if we're just living halfway, that our kids will not do it at all? They won't. If 
we're just given half, our kids will walk away. It's a sad commentary. When only 10% of the kids that grow up in the church actually live for God. That's a true statistic. It's a sad commentary. What are we doing in our homes, folks? And I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here. I want you to understand. We have to be committed. Committed in every aspect of our life. Not just for ourselves. But when we bring others into this world that we're responsible for. I can't for one second. Which one of my kids do I want to give away? Which one do I want to give up to the enemy? Do I want to give Colt? How about Savannah? Do I want to give Remington away? How about Josh? Which one of them means the least to me? Which one would I just so willingly toss to the enemy? I am in it to win it. And not just for me, but for my kids. For this next generation that is following us. I am in it to win it because I want them to see somebody that is successful in the battle. I may not be perfect. I may fall down and make mistakes. But I'm going to get my rear end up and I'm going to keep walking because I have got people watching me that need me to make it. And I want to make it for myself. I am in it to win it. If there's one thing that is greater than the value of life itself, and I would argue that kids are greater, the value of my children are greater than my life. If I thought for one second one of my kids was going to die and I had to give my life in their place, let this old man go. I would give my life in a heartbeat for one of my children. But if, if that's not even in the cards for you, the one thing that must be greater than the value that we place on our life, if we're going to be in it to win it, is our faith. Our faith has to have greater value than our life. Because if it doesn't, when our metal is being tested, we won't make it. Our faith must have greater value than our life. If it came down to it, and somebody had a gun to my head and said, deny Christ or die, what would I be willing to do? And if I'm not in it to win it, I will deny Christ. Because my life is greater than my faith. But if I'm in it to win it, I'll look the man straight in the eye and I'll say, pull the trigger. Because death is but a doorway. And you'll end this here. And when I open my eyes, my prize will be waiting on the other side. Do your worst. Pull that trigger. Because my life does not have the same value as my faith. It's not a matter of whether or not we're going to die. It's a matter of whether we're going to die saved or unsaved. Hallelujah. You could all stand. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. You want to win the battle? Set your affections on the things above. Take everything in the closet. I'd say have a garage sale, but you don't really want to give the junk to other people. Burn it. Take everything out that shouldn't be there and burn it. And set our affections on him and him alone. Let's not be distracted by the things of this world. Hallelujah. Praise God. You guys have a song that you want to sing? All right. Well, go ahead. I'd love to hear your beautiful voices. Let's worship for a little bit. Praise God.